Roberta McLeod is a producer, a writer, director. He joins us this morning from Budapest, Hungary. Afternoon where you are. Berta, welcome. It's good to have you here. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be on. You know, we have a lot of people that we can look back in history and look at their story, look at what they did for Christ and for the sake of the gospel and, you know, take so much from that and glean from that. And I know that is something that you're very interested in. Um, we've got a new uh, project. Um, it's called Morning Star. It's a story of John Wycliffe. You've done things on John Knox. Where did your interest in kind of that era of the, the Christian church come from? I guess I've always had an interest in uh, Christian history and this in the story of how we got from the times of the Bible to today. I guess for myself, I see it a little bit like a, like a family tree. Um, I'm a Christian because people in my life brought me to Christ. Obviously, there was a direct connection between myself and Christ spiritually, but the gospel was transmitted to me by my parents were crucial for me, but also other church leaders and other uh, Christian contexts. But each one of these people, in turn, had someone before them that led them to Christ, and so on and so forth. And it goes back in a sort of a chain of relationships and personal connections, all the way back through the centuries until you get to Jesus and the original apostles. But this chain, for me, I think, is often neglected in the church that we talk about our current generation <clears throat> in the 21st century, and then we talk about history as back in the first century in the Book of Acts, and there's we, we just miss out everything that came between. And for me, that fails to really understand our own context and see where it is that we've come from and really connect us back personally to the early church. <laughs> we didn't just pop out of a vacuum. That, that, that's so true. And what do you think the value is of going back and looking at some of those historical figures that did make that uh, difference? I, obviously, you know, what you just said, we, we know that um, we just didn't pop out of this vacuum uh, type thing. But as, as you've begun to dig in and uh, learn some of these stories, well, what's been the value for you personally? Well, one of the key things is that God is the same God today as God was in the times of John Wycliffe, John Knox, the people I've made films about, and of course, all the others that I haven't made films about. Uh, God did great works in the lives of these people, and the same God that did great works in their lives can do great works in our lives today. So for me to study the faith journeys of others in the past helps me in my own faith journey today to feel that I'm not just making stuff up. I'm living as part of a great continuity of Christians who have gone before, who have all trusted in Christ. Um, one minute. So we're going to do a very quick high-level answer here, and then we're going to unpack that coming up in our next segment. What makes John Wycliffe so compelling? Two things. One, he's the first translator of the Bible into the English language. And second, he's known as the morning star of the Reformation. So he was around before Martin Luther and John Calvin. He was there about 150 years earlier. And he was like the little light on the horizon, like the, the morning star that appears before the dawn in the darkest times. We're talking with Murda McLeod. He is a producer, writer, director. He's uh, released a project called Morning Star. It's taking a look at the life of John Wycliffe. And... Uh, we've got links to the DVD at our uh, Facebook page. On Facebook, it's just Don, John, uh, Don and Steve in the morning. But Murdo, you called John Wycliffe Morning Star. It seems like that was some uh, bit of a nickname for him. D tell me the story behind that. How did he end up getting called Morning Star? Well, sure. Certainly, he was not, not called Morning Star during his own lifetime. It was something that only came around perhaps centuries later. Um, so John Wycliffe was around, as I said, about 150 years before the Reformation, before Martin Luther and John Calvin. But in his theology and in his lifestyle and his sort of view of what Christianity should be, he prefigured, in a sense, some of what the reformers would later uh, come to teach and to believe. So one thing, for example, was he was very critical of the way that the church had turned from being a, a pure and holy body of, of Christian believers to being more of a political institution that was all about land ownership and 
oppression of the masses. Um, at the time, the church owned about a third of the European continent in terms of sheer land ownership. So huge numbers of people saw their local priest or bishop as their landlord. They needed to pay tax, they needed to pay, to pay rent. And the church was getting mixed up in all this uh, politics, and it wasn't purely and simply giving the gospel message and looking after people's souls. So for Wycliffe, this was a big, big problem. And he said that we need to turn away from all these traditions that we've built up over the centuries of how we do Christianity. We need to go back to the Bible and find out what Christianity is really about. And so by getting everyone to read their Bibles and by getting everyone to reject the sort of built up tradition of the centuries, he laid the groundwork in many cases for what would come with Martin Luther, John Calvin and these other reformers uh, a little bit later on. So in that sense, he's known as the morning star, um, morning star of the Reformation. But this was a, a name that was given to him much later, much uh, after the Reformation, when people were able to look back and reevaluate his legacy. I can't imagine that as he began to express his concerns in whatever uh, way he did that, that that was well received by the church. <laughs> Talk about, you know, I, I would imagine there was some persecution that he, he had to live through. What, what was that like for him? Uh, certainly, yes. The, uh, the church, we do tend to talk about this, the church, as though it's a single thing. But of course, the church was a, a massive organization it, and had a huge number of people in it who all had different agendas and different purposes. Some people in the church really liked what he had to say. A lot of the students in Oxford and some of the other scholars there really appreciated it. And for a while, Oxford became a center of the sort of new reform movement. Other people, especially those at the highest levels of leadership, were highly opposed to what he had to say. And he ended up being summoned for disciplinary hearings, for trials. The Pope ended up writing letters to the King of England saying, send this man to my court. I demand that he appear before me charged with heresy. He ended up in prison. There was a lot of persecution that he had to live through. But his motto was that the truth will prevail. And so it didn't really matter if he, all, everyone around him was calling him a liar or calling him misguided, deluded. He was standing firm on the truth. And therefore, in the end, it would be his truth, to use a very postmodern term, it would be the truth that he would, uh, understood to be the truth that would prevail. So he was confident that despite everything that would happen, he would be vindicated in the end. Hmm. And uh, so let's, let's jump to the end here real quick. Um, was he vindicated before the end of his life? Uh, no. Uh, before <laughs> the end of his life, I would say no. Uh, he ended up uh, being expelled from Oxford. Uh, he was able to die in peace. He had a stroke and died of old age, which is a rare feat for someone who was so controversial and so disliked by so many people. At the time, people were getting burnt for heresy, uh, burnt at the stake. Uh, Wycliffe managed to avoid that. So um, you can see the providence and the grace of God in that. But it was really, it was only after Wycliffe died um, indeed, after Wycliffe died, his bones were dug up and burned for heresy. So the church was not content to let him rest in the grave in peace. They insisted that he was a heretic and had to burn dead or alive. So, um, yeah, he wasn't really vindicated until much later after his death. Yeah, well, not vindicated till then, but what a legacy he has left. You mentioned a little bit ago that he also was the one who translated the Bible into English. And so we're going to come back in just a little bit, talk about that uh, Bible translation and kind of the legacy that we see of his life even today. But if you want to know more about the life and the story of John Wycliffe, uh, Murdo has produced a film on this, and we've got links to the DVD on our Facebook page. If you're on Facebook, you're just looking for Don and Steve in the morning, and you're going to find it right there. Which is continuing with Murdo McLeod. He's a producer, writer, director. He's got a film out called Morning Star. It's taking a look at the life of John Wycliffe. And Murdo, a little bit uh, earlier in uh, the conversation, you'd mentioned that he was the guy who translated the Bible into English. Uh, what do you know about his heart? for Bible translation. Right. He's a very interesting guy from a Bible translation point of view, um, because, as you say, he's the first person to translate the Bible 
fully into English. There had been some translations into English before. In fact, the very first translation was by King Alfred the Great, who had translated the Gospels and some of the Psalms. But Wycliffe's claim to fame is that he translated the whole thing. Um, for Wycliffe, the Bible really was the, the foundation of Christianity. It was something that was almost semi-divine. It was so closely connected to Jesus because Jesus is the word of God and the Bible is the word of God. So when you have the Bible in front of you, it's like Jesus is speaking directly to you through the words. So the Bible for Wycliffe was something incredibly important, and it was vital that people should be able to read it and understand it in their own language. And so for Wycliffe, getting the Bible into English was essential. It was there a lot of pushback? Because I, I, if I'm remembering my church history correctly, there were many of, the, of those who kind of held the power in the church who said, no, we want people to come to us to be able to hear the word of God, not necessarily to be able to, to have that in their own language. So w was there a lot of a pushback for him in doing this? Absolutely. And uh, some of it is more understandable than we think, perhaps, in the 21st century. At the time, there was a lot of concern that if people just simply got the Bible and read it out of context and just pulling verses here and there and perhaps not being able to read all that well, they would completely misunderstand what Christianity was all about. So that was the official reason why the church said, we don't think you should read the Bible yourselves. However, unofficially and perhaps a little cynically, I can't help but think that they were a bit miffed that the filter between people and God, which was themselves, was being taken out of the equation. And there was no really no need for the clerics any longer if people could access God directly for themselves through the Bible. So for some in the church leadership, especially, this was a dangerous development. Mm -hmm. Well, the uh, story of John Wycliffe is in this film called Morningstar. And uh, Murdo, tell us a little bit uh, about the film itself and why you decided, I want to make this story into a film. Cool. So they... they Film is a docudrama. It's uh, a, half of it is simply telling us Wycliffe's story, getting uh, interviews to uh, give us their expert opinions on John Wycliffe, and the other half is drama. It's connecting to John Wycliffe as a as an individual and as a human being, because I think that sometimes when we look at church history, it can be a little bit boring. It can be a little bit like a historical lecture, and we lose interest, we lose connection. So getting it on film and being able to see Wycliffe having a drink or interacting with uh, with his uh, his friends or having an argument with a bishop it really connects us to who this guy was what he believed and what really motivated him and it brings him to life yeah and so what is your hope for the person who watches this film what what do you hope they take away from it I'm not really going in with a specific agenda of, oh, I'm hoping that they suddenly become a Bible translator and go off to some foreign land and uh, help help uh, in the, the work there. I think that Wycliffe speaks for himself, and he speaks to different people in different ways. So as we've been going around with this film, producing it and, and showing it to people, um, we've had question and answer discussions after these events. And usually they go off in completely different directions, depending on the audience, because Wycliffe talks to us in different ways, depending on who we are and what it is that we uh, find inspiring. But one thing is that Wycliffe is just an incredible figure. He had a huge brain, a huge mind, and he thought really, really deep thoughts. So as we explore that in the film, different light bulbs pop up in different people's minds and they, uh, they begin to, to see something that they hadn't seen before. Murdo McLeod with us. Uh, he is the producer, director, writer. Um, he's done a story of John Knox. Obviously, we've been talking this morning about the story of uh, John Wycliffe. His film is called Morningstar. And if you want to get a copy of this, we want to connect you to the film. And so we've got the link on our Facebook page. On Facebook, you're just looking for Don and Steve in the morning, and you can find the information that you need right there. Murdo, appreciate your time this morning. Continue telling those good stories. 